All right, so here is the story. First, I would like to say that this is a Patreon request from a new patron of mine, Chris Nicholson. So thank you for the Patreon donation, and thank you for the request of Silence of the Lambs. This will definitely be one that people will uh, be watching, because this is one of the most popular, beloved movies of all time. And there's always that argument of, is it horror? Because this is the... I mean, technically, the only horror movie that's ever won Best Picture, if you consider it a horror movie. Would I consider it a horror movie? Um, I don't know. I, I don't get into those debates. I don't really care. I, that just doesn't... That's not really that relevant to me. But if I had to put a label on it, it's a psychological detective thriller with horror elements. So horror is in there. Um... So yeah, seven horror, you know, is the bone collector horror, is, are any of these detective thrillers, these darker R-rated detective thrillers horror movies? Does it really matter? I mean, it really doesn't. The whole, like, classification game is, is pointless to me. So anyway, um, what happened was about six months to a year ago, somewhere in that area. The mother of my children, Jennifer, and I sat down because her and I have reviewed a few things. And I asked her what she would want her next review to be with me on the channel. And her favorite movie is Silence of the Lambs. And so she said, I want to do Silence of the Lambs. And I said, okay, how about this? This would be fun. Why don't we review the entire Hannibal franchise and we can sit down and talk about them individually? So she agreed, and we watched Red. We watched Manhunter, Silence of the Lambs, Hannibal, Red Dragon, Hannibal Rising, and the Hannibal Television series. We watched in preparation for this big, long, like you know, multi-video discussion, and then we had a big falling out, and it never happened. And I just didn't feel like doing it without her. I took notes for every single thing and everything. Now. When Chris asked me to do this, I was like, well, do I really need to rewatch this thing? How many times have I seen this movie now? So I did not rewatch it, but I know the film extremely well, and I did just watch it and take pretty good notes recently. Although my discussion would have been drastically different with a counterpart next to me, kind of giving her perspective on things, which would have been fun, but, you know, that's not the review that we're getting. We're getting the review here by myself. So, I mean, I wouldn't really call this a review. I always call these discussions for a reason. I'm not really reviewing this movie. This movie doesn't need reviewing. This movie is pretty much perfect, and anything I could say wouldn't just, you know, wouldn't, wouldn't do it any justice anyways when it comes to it's like, you know, uh, breakdown of how wonderful it is. It's a fantastic film. I know very few people who are going to disagree. Of course, there's always the outliers. There's always the people who are going to be on the outside and are going to be like, this movie's not good or overrated or what. Okay, fine, sure, whatever. Those people always exist. But for the most part, it's very, very rare you're going to find a person who doesn't love this movie um, unless they're extremely sensitive to this kind of subject matter. I've always been fascinated, though, that people who are extremely opposed to horror, horrific elements, this and that, are all about these movies because of the psychological elements. But I find it kind of ironic because this is very realistic stuff that does take place, obviously, since Hannibal Lecter is based on multiple killers, one, uh, two of which are Ed Gein and um, Ted Bundy. So since those guys did exist and did commit horrific acts, and what you're watching is almost a biography on those men, so you're, you're actually watching something that essentially does happen a lot and has happened, I find it odd that you can't watch a monster movie or something where fictional things are coming off to kill fictional characters in ways that are impossible. But you find that to be way too disturbing. But watching something that actually has happened is entertaining to you. That, I, I'll never understand. But, it's 
it is what it is. You know? <laughs> so, now, the movie itself. Um, so Jodie Foster plays Clarice Starling, and the film really centers around her. Hannibal Lecter is a secondary character. He's only in this movie maybe like 30 minutes, which I think he holds the record, right, for the shortest performance to win Best Actor in a film, um, as opposed to Best Supporting Actor, which I feel like he should have been nominated for. I don't feel like... Because, and here's another thing, and I think I've mentioned this before, but I do want to bring this up. I think this is an extremely important note. When you ever hear anybody talk about this film, when people, you know, parody this movie, especially when people parody this movie, nine times out of ten, I might be over-exaggerating there, but not far off for me, nine times out of ten, they're bringing up the Buffalo Bill stuff, not the Hannibal stuff. Yes, you get the, you know, the Hello Clarice thing, which is, you know, as we know, is not the actual line in the movie. That's one of those Mandela effects things, but it doesn't matter. When people talk about this film, they always talk about, especially the Goodbye Horses dick tuck dance that Buffalo Bill does in front of his camera. That is the most iconic moment of this movie. I think that, and this is a testament to how amazing uh, Anthony Hopkins' performance is, but I feel like as far as the discussion goes, the discussion is always that, oh my God, Anthony Hopkins is incredible as Hannibal. But not a lot of attention is given to Ted Levine's performance as Buffalo Bill or Jane Gunn. And I just, think that's such a shame because he's as iconic and his performance is as good as uh, Hopkins is any day of the week. They are just as good as one another. They're just as, as, as memorable. They're just as quotable. It's just, I don't feel like Ted Levine gets the credit that's deserved to him in this. Now, why is that? Well, I think Number one is because Anthony Hopkins is a bigger name. Number two, because the Hannibal franchise continued on without Jane Gunn for obvious reasons. And so Hannibal became kind of a household staple once he made Hannibal and Red Dragon, respectively. So I do think that that played a role. That said, I feel like even back in the day, now you're talking back in the early 90s here, Maybe my memory isn't serving me correctly because I was only like 10 years old or less. I think I was like 9 years old when this movie came out. Maybe even 8. Is this 90 or 91? I think this came out in 90. Um, which is crazy to me because when people are trashing 90s horror and they consider this a horror and they're like, oh, 90s, you know, 90s didn't put out any good horror. And it's like, but you think Silence of the Lambs is horror? And they're like, yeah. And you're like, uh, so then one of the greatest movies of all time was made in the 90s. But that all being said, was Anthony Hopkins' performance overshadowing Ted Levine's performance at that time? I remember it being the case, yes. Because, of course, then again, we had Best Actor uh, win for Anthony Hopkins. Now, was Ted Levine nominated for Supporting Actor? I do not know. So, someone tell me below. Um, if he wasn't, that's a damn shame. Um, that's a damn shame. Because he's unbelievable in this film. He's so... Okay, I actually take that back. He's not unbelievable. His performance is extremely believable. That is why it's so good. He nails this role. You know? So now, Clarice Starling. This is a very, very interesting film because of Clarice's character in this film. Now, I'm not usually one to read into things too much in film. But, when it comes to this film, I do think that it is interesting how, when Clarice encounters men in this movie, the men in this movie are very dismissive or are 
belittling to her or they only look at her as a sexual object, she has to deal with being downplayed. She has to deal with being sexualized. She has to deal with, uh, you know, people not respecting her. There's so many characters in this. Every character in this movie either looks at her like, what's this little girl doing here? Or, how do I get my dick in this, you know, in this chick? Like, that's essentially what she runs into. And I think that it's very interesting when she walks in to the mental institution or the prison, whatever, and, you know, Barney lets her in, and she walks past all of these depraved criminals like Migs and who not, and whatnot. And you kind of see the character, the character of the crazy person that one would expect in these ridiculously disgusting men. Now, Mig's character, obviously, is a sexual deviant, masturbates, throws his semen on her, whatever. But he's just more of an exaggerated character that would be comparative to other normal men in this movie who are essentially just throwing their semen at her. So they're kind of like gross representations exaggerated representations of the men that she encounters. And also, as I said, caricatures of what you would expect of a psychopath. So they very much fit that role. But then she meets Hannibal. Now this is her first encounter with Hannibal Lecter. She's only heard of him by reputation. Knows really nothing about the guy. And of course you would think, Hannibal, this and that, he's got to be psychotic. And while Hannibal is undeniably... Um, <laughs> deranged he's also extremely regal he's extremely classy and provocative and he is the only character in this movie that treats Clarice as an equal he is the only guy in this movie who wants her who wants to get to know her, who asks deep philosophical questions about who she is. He genuinely wants to know who Clarice is. He falls in love with who Clarice is. Not just the way she looks or what he thinks he can get from her, whatever. The only respect that Clarice really gets in this movie, in a male character, is from Hannibal Lecter. And that paints this very bizarre picture of the men in Clarice's life. She had this relationship with her father, which we get to see in a flashback, and she has this wonderful memory with him. But it seems like from that point on, men have been basically constantly disappointing her. And so you kind of flash forward to the meeting of this psychopath, and Hannibal Lecter is the most decent guy in her life. He, look, he peers deep into her soul. He truly looks at her. He's not objectifying her. He's interested in her. He's intrigued by her. He's infatuated with her. And he genuinely wants to know what makes Clarice tick. He wants to get into her head. He asks about her childhood. He gets the story of the screaming of the lambs. And he connects to her on a human level. And even at the end of the film, his intentions, he has no intentions to harm her. When he hands her the paper and gives her the clues that she needs, he brushes her finger, because that's all he needs. He just needs some contact with her. doesn't need to fuck her. He doesn't need to do any of these things. He just wants to... He just wants to know her. He just wants to have a slight encounter, just a touch. And it's very romantic in a sick way. And when Jodie Foster turned down the role for the next movie, she did so because she thought that it was not in her character to have a sort of romantic uh, relationship with Hannibal Lecter. And I feel like this film very much paints the picture that Clarice is, you know, I don't want to say turned on. She's not turned on. 
but I think her curiosity has been piqued with him because she looks at this man and she knows that he's a monster. But that's not the way he presents himself. That's not the man that she gets to know in this movie. She keeps her distance because she knows better. She's a smart, intelligent woman. But there also is intrigue there. And I think the dynamic between her and Anthony Hopkins, her and, and Hannibal Lecter, is really the heart of this film. That's where a lot of the intrigue lies. Now, there's plenty of other things to get into the psychology of here. Why James Gunn is the way he is. Why he uses moths um, as opposed to butterflies because of the, you know, the transformative nature of a butterfly versus the one of a moth. One is seen as beautiful, the other one is seen as less than, so it's almost like a negative quality. Um, and this is a guy who's been rejected by society or he's been rejected by those who he looks to for um, acceptance and, and he believes, he tries to change himself to, to belong. He tries to change himself to feel like he's beautiful, that he's accepted. And so he, he becomes obsessed with this idea that he can, that he can change his, his persona, that he can become someone new, that he can transform and become this beautiful butterfly even though, as I said, he uses the moth, which is um, very symbolic for, for where his mindset is at. So he's just such a rich character, and so is Hannibal, and so is Clarice. Now, I did not care for Hannibal at all, the Ridley Scott sequel. I thought that movie was pretty terrible actually like I'd seen it in theaters and I hadn't seen it since and I watched it just recently after this and it is shockingly downgrade from this film now Manhunter which is much more style over substance is a beautiful display of Michael Mann's talent as a visual director now that's not because there is no substance within the film but that the film relies more on visual cues than deep you know um deep characters. And then you have uh, Red Dragon, which is a remake of Michael Mann, which has very little of the style, but tries to up the substance, and it kind of is a mixed bag for me. I thought it was okay, but nothing amazing. Um, I prefer the Mann version because I prefer his style of filmmaking. Um, Hannibal Rising was yet again another mediocre effort with a decent performance from the actor who plays young Hannibal Lecter. And then you have what is probably my most controversial opinion in Mads Mikkelsen's portrayal of Hannibal in the Hannibal television series, the best performance of Hannibal Lecter on screen to this day. Now, I do always try to follow that up by saying that I feel that is almost unfair because Mads has an insane amount of time comparison you know, in comparison to Hannibal, uh, to uh, Anthony Hopkins, who gets three films, so it all allots to maybe two hours of on-screen time altogether, as to where Matt Mickelson probably gets 15. So you get a lot more out of Matt. But that fucking series, if you have not watched the Hannibal television series, you are doing yourself a great disservice. I think it is one of the most brilliant most artistically beautiful, most rich, vibrant, incredible shows that was ever on television. And I really, really hope that we can get another season. I would love to see it go into the Silence of the Lambs territory. Now that we're kind of done with the Red Dragon stuff in that storyline, I would love to see Mads Mikkelsen's take and that version, you know, the people, the showrunners of that show, I'd love to see their take on a silence of the lands something along those lines that would be fun that would be phenomenal because mads is just incredible um as is everybody else in the show not to take away from lawrence fishburne or um the the actor who plays the other main character i they're all i for some reason i'm blanking on his name right now but regardless uh will uh what's that actor's name um I'd know it if I saw it. Regardless, um, an incredible performance 
by all of everybody. The art, like, the the set pieces in that of the aftermath kills. Like, there's the most inventive, artistic, freaking display of carnage I've ever seen on screen. It's like a work of art. It's beauty. Even though it's as disgusting and disturbing as it may be, it's still visually stunning. I mean, every episode they would come out with this other display of like this artistic take on a on a murder scene of like people with their backs laid open to have like uh angel wings and and bodies made into a you know a toad um you know a a big totem just incredibly imaginative uh visual stuff and man and 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 the show is so deep it's crazy it's such a fantastic show but yeah, I mean, when I really sit back and I think about this film, I, I I really am always drawn to the idea of Clarissa's surrounding male figures in her life, where she meets Jack Crawford, she meets Dr. Chilton, she meets these guys, and they're all very surface level. And and then when she goes in to investigate and she tries to kind of get her voice in there, and all the cops who she tells to leave the room, like we need to have those guys look at her like the fuck are you get lost and then a man has to kind of step in and and tell them and then they'll be like oh okay she gets no respect you know she she's in the academy and everyone looks down and and, and she's even a ploy i mean that's kind of the irony of it as well is that crawford doesn't even really have he, he he uses what he thinks is hannibal's weakness against him he sends a young pretty girl in there and while it does work um I think he, he he greatly underestimates her, and obviously they end up being dead wrong, and she is of course um, the one who stumbles upon the actual killer. But there's other characters within this that she encounters, like the bug guys, and one of them is hitting on her. She encounters the guy at the storage unit who's like, oh, maybe we should wait till the morning to get a man here to fucking open this up. Like everyone under underestimates this woman. Now, if this movie was made today, I do fear that people would see this as feminist propagandic agendas. And that is where my annoyance comes with everybody throwing that kind of shit around these days. Like, oh, these strong female leads, why do they got to keep shoving this shit down our throat? These characters have existed in cinema for decades. You just weren't sensitive to them like you are now. And people will argue, no, it's because it's, it's which much more like in my face and apparent now. Okay, fine. I can't convince you, but I think you are dead fucking wrong. These me female characters, these strong female leads that are dealing with shitty men around them. You love Silence of the Lambs, but then you trash other films that do try to do things like that. Women around guys that don't treat them as equals and they have to prove themselves. These characters existed long before the last five years. Please, please see that. But anyway, um, yeah, I mean, <laughs> it, it's definitely, you definitely have, it's a hard time not to talk, you know, I've already mentioned this, but the Goodbye Horses dance sequence is, it's definitely one of the uh, most memorable sequences in film history. You will never forget that scene, and, and it's been parodied about five trillion times. That might be an exaggeration, but I'm not sure by much. I know everybody, every guy has, has done the tuck at some point and looked at himself in the mirror and been like, I'm a girl. Um, but yeah, I mean, what else can I say about this movie? I, I love everything about it. Um, you know, yeah, I mean, I, I, there's so many great Hannibal lines. Um, but as I said, I, I, everybody knows the iconic stuff. But I think that what I'm kind of touching upon is stuff I don't see talked about as much. I'm sure it's talked about plenty. But when I hear about this movie, most people just go to the quotable lines. They go to the obvious sequences where Hannibal breaks out of jail and he uses another guy's face to get out of there. And... Um, his line at the end of having a, an old friend for dinner. and You know, 
all in the, the you know the fava beans with the nice bottle of Chianti and the you know all that stuff, um, which I think I've said this before when it comes to um, why lines are misproperly quoted. Uh, I do think that has to do with um, other pop culture references to it, like the cable guy when he goes to dinner with. Um, um, oh, well, wait, wait, hold on, I know this. Um, oh, shit, why can't I think? Steven, Jesus Christ. I was like, I'm not going to blow this right now. No way. So he goes, he takes Steven out to, to uh, medieval times, and then he puts the skin on his face, and he's like, Hello, Clarice. And I think that's why everyone remembers that line as Hello, Clarice, as does uh, Chris Farley in Tommy Boy or Black Sheep. I think it's Tommy Boy. When he goes into the fan and he says, Luke, I am your father. I think that's where everyone quotes the movie crying incorrectly. I think it's just other films, uh, you know, it's other actors that have fucked these things up for us. So that's, that's my, uh, that's my belief anyway. Um, yeah, Silence of the Lambs. I mean, this is one of those movies where you're just so jealous when someone tells you they haven't seen it. You're just like, what? You get to experience Silence of the Lambs for the first time? Because how many films, like, this subgenre of film is not done anywhere near enough. And to this quality, to this caliber, there are almost none. The closest thing you have to this is seven. And then people say, like, the closest thing you have to that is Saw. I, I don't know. Like, I get that. I do get that. But then the 90s had a slew of these trying to capitalize on this genre because it won Best Picture. So they put out all of those um, 90s crime detective thriller films. Um, you had a you had a freaking just a slew of them. Murder by Numbers, Along Came a Spider, um which, of course, was a sequel to that uh, um, Kiss the Girls with Morgan Freeman. Like, you've got the NSA Bone Collector, stuff like that, which I think Bone Collector is later. I think that's like 2000, well, maybe 99. That was Angelina Jolie and Denzel, right? So it's, yeah, like late 90s, that's a little later on. But you got a good slew of these films. Um, 90s thriller action stuff is, is, is an interest. I like, um, oh, the copycat, stuff like that with Sigourney Weaver. I think, isn't that Ali Sheedy as well? Um, yeah, you, you definitely got a lot of films trying to emulate stuff in here. Um, you even got stuff later on, like Untraceable, um, which, which they're, they're all pretty good, you know, pretty good. But very few films are able to hit on this level. And I think that the Hannibal television series does this such an amazing justice. Like, it is so, so fantastic. So please, I implore you to check that out. Um, yeah, typically I would get into, like, every single little, like, uh, scene in the movie and all, all my favorite stuff. Uh, <laughs> I used to do a really good uh, Buffalo Bill um, impression. I would always, I would always do his like, weren't you a little bit fat person? Like I always used to love doing that to people, and almost everyone would be like, oh my god, is that Buffalo Bill? Like I was always like, I don't do impressions almost ever, but I was always able to kind of uh, to properly, at least, at least I say. It. I don't know how that will pick up on the mic, but I remember that always being pretty damn spot on. Um, but I just love him. I, if I had to pick my favorite character in the movie, it is not Hannibal, it is not Clarice, it is not any of those people. It, it is definitely Buffalo Bill, uh, James Gum. I think his performance in this is just, <laughs> it's so iconic. It's so hilariously tragic. I want to say that that's the best description of his character. It's hilariously tragic. There's so many moments where you laugh because it's just so ridiculous how some of the shit he does. But at the same time, he's just, you can tell he's such a distraught character. Like when um, the girl's down in the, in the well and she's screaming up at him, you can see his heart is breaking and he hates it. He hates himself. 
You know, he doesn't want to do this stuff. But he, so he's a very conflicted character. He's not black and white. He's not just straight across the board evil. You know, he's, he's, he wants to be the person that he's looking to be, and he's willing to sacrifice others to get it, um, which is pure, pure um, insanity. That's, that's depravity at its lowest point, but that doesn't take away from the fact that it's tragic. He is a tragic character. So, yeah, there you go. Silence of the Lamb. Thank you to Chris for um, suggesting this or requesting this. Uh, I hope you guys enjoyed it. And uh, I will not be covering the other films in the franchise. I lost those notes, and I don't really have any interest in revisiting them. So, um, But I, I spoke a little bit on all of them, so I hope that was enough. Um, so, anyway, all right, got to go pick up my kids. Adios.